Um, so then he fucked in Sherman. All right. Anyway, so you probably know. I don't know. You, I, you probably don't know anything about Sidney Sherman. Whatever. Um, made these work in the 60s, film stills, untitled film stills, where she sort of adopted the language of the cinema to create these singular images which contain within them a lot of narrative ideas, right? So using these sort of symbolic things that we take from how cinema works, um, I say cinema because I'm, you know, fucking fancy, whatever, movies, um, how those work and constructing something that we immediately read as a story, that we immediately give her character um, traits and a backstory and conflict and tension. Um, you know, like this is classic, right? She's like, we're like, oh, don't get in the car. They're going to be a murderer, right? Um, so they're good. I feel like I don't like Cindy Sherman, and you should not let that make you not like Cindy Sherman. Um, and I think that the early work and some of the later work, whatever, I don't know. There's some good stuff there. Um, as a self-portrait, right, is this Cindy Sherman? No, right? This is a third character, whatever, that she is constructing, that she is playing the role of, right? So thinking about self-portraiture, what is it saying about the self, right? I would say that this says nothing about who Cindy Sherman actually is. Um, so, you know, look her up, form your own opinions, don't just take my jackassery. Um, you know, I mean, she does a really good job of taking these languages of image making that I have culturally embedded in me um, and working with them to give me a single image that tells a story, right? So, I mean, it's hard. She did it. Um, is it cross-cultural? I don't know. That's an interesting question, right? If I were to come from another culture and use symbols that were outside of Brad's Western culture thing, um, how would that read? I don't know. Maybe you can do that. See, the later stuff is like just super fucking ugly. I don't want to look at it. Um, Renee Cox. So I have Renee Cox right after Cindy Sherman because both of them are adopting roles, adopting personas. Renee Cox is also working in frequently in narrative form, but she has a consistent persona throughout it. Whereas Cindy Sherman is going to go from one person in one picture to a completely unrelated person in the next photograph. Renee Cox is adopting these personas and then sort of storyboarding out an arc for them. Um, so this is, uh, oh my God, it's uh, something charm of the bourgeois, the, the discreet charm of the bougie um, by Renee Cox. Look it up. She's very interesting, has done a bunch of work, uh, started out as a fashion model, um, quickly came around to behind the camera, working, making images, um, and then went into fine art had this not, I would assume, atypical moment where she went to uh, the Whitney ISP, which is this like fancy art programmy thing, um, and she had a kid, and while she was there, she found out she was pregnant with her second child, and basically everybody was like, oh my God, there goes your career, and she was like, suck it. Um, I'm gonna make some work about this, so fuck you. Um, and made all of this great sort of like other motherhood work that is not this project. Um, but adopting this role, playing out these things, um, again, some symbolic stuff. If you read about uh, the project, um, oh, I've forgotten the Missy. Uh, Missy is this character, right? So she has all these traits um, of fanciness, right? She's got the poodle, <laughs> just like Jessica Todd Harper. Um, you know, she's got this sort of anonymous white servant. Um, she has, interestingly, Renee Cox work on the wall. Um, you know, she is out there living life, doing her thing. Um, she then, at some point, uh, starts traveling. She goes to Ghana. She goes to, oh, somewhere in Asia. I've already forgotten. Um, and this moment of, um, I don't know, I'll say reawakening. Um, kind of coming into herself, right? She loses the wig, which has been there throughout, um, you know, and can you read getting rid of the wig as sort of, you know, walking away from this sort of like bourgeois white supremacist notion of, uh, I don't know, like 
upper class standards and beauty and all the other stuff, yeah, you can do that. Um, you know, again, check her out, Renee Cox, a um, lot of work. Her work for me, I really like the ideas in the work and the meaning in the work and the stories in the work. And I'm, I'm sort of less into the aesthetics of the work, right? In some ways, it's almost the opposite of Jessica Todd Harper, where the Jessica's work is incredibly beautiful, um, but I'm not really interested in what's behind it. Um, for me, Renee Cox's work, incredibly interesting, provocative, um, but I don't know, but looking at it doesn't do as much for me. So I think as a photographer, it's interesting to think about those two things, right? Where you put the importance, how you can bring both of them together. Um, Omar Victor Diop, he's Senegalese, um, wanted to go back and make these pictures that were um, sort of overturning a typical African diaspora image of um, you know who Africans were, right? And again, right? So not African American, right? African from Senegal, um, and is going and taking source images of um, famous, interesting, powerful, respected, um, historic African figures and embodying them. Uh, he's bringing in these accessories that are um, football, soccer, um, things like balls, keepers gloves, uh, trophies. Um, because he's thinking about the way that Africa is represented within Europe and these sort of um, sort of heroic lionized hero, heroic hero, sorry, um, of the like African footballer, but then also the fact that you know you're in Italy and people are throwing bananas at the football pitch, right? Like all of these things, the complexities of that, um, you know, these different past and present narratives. Um, and putting them together. Also, again, beautiful pictures, like incredibly gorgeous, right? They are coming from some sort of historical precedent, but he is creating something himself, which is itself beautiful. Uh, if you go through the slideshow PDF thing, you can read um, all the text. He talks about who the people are, uh, what their life was like, where he got the source material, um, right? Frederick Douglass. Um, this painting, I feel like, was actually in the Met for a while. Uh, but yeah, really good. Sorry, didn't go through these really fast. Uh, Sean Fader, um, former FIT professor guy, um, he was doing this project where every day um, he would sort of take a selfie and then had it retouched by freelancers. Um, he had a whole bunch of green screen selfies, right? So meaning that the background could easily be cut out. Sent it out to all of these like photo retouchery people and had them recreate him um, as kind of whatever they wanted, right? And so this is a series of portraits. Um, sorry, just briefly, Omar Victor Diop. If you go read the article that I think that I've linked to in the website, um, he talks about why he thinks these are not self-portraits. Um, and I think it would be interesting to think about what you think, right? Are they self-portraits? Are they not? Is he, um, do you agree with his position on those things? Anyway, Sean Fader. Um, and so had all these pictures made with like sort of like background images out of the internet, self-portrait of himself uh, by all these anonymous Photoshop jockeys. Um, and so then ends up with all these pictures that are, um, someone else's idea of who he might be. Uh, so again, right, it is a self-portrait in that he took this original picture. It is something that he commissioned in a way from all of these people. Um, but the final image is both A, fictional, and B, not something that he had a lot of control over. Um, so ways of making a self-portrait very different, very strange, very sort of like social media, right? Like post-production, global economy, like all those things come into this fairly lighthearted, somewhat goofy photo series. Um, worth checking out. Again, 
hundreds of them. <laughs> right? Like the fact that you've got this picture um, and also like that picture, um, you know, this where he's like, I don't know, some like uptight bodybuilder bro. Um, or here where he's like, happy suburban dad guy. Um, Palma Pagi Sapuya. Uh, so these images are maybe the most, I don't say the most abstract, um, because I think Arno and John Copeland's um, are certainly sculptural and abstract in that way. Um, but uh, he's working with um, mirrors, he's working with his own body, he's working with photographs being brought into the scene. Let's see if I can get to another one, right? So here you can see there are more than one person kind of reaching in onto this set. He is the one clicking the picture or the shutter, or whatever. Um, he is there, he is not necessarily wholly visible. Um, right here, there's this magical moment where there's like, you sort of see past into the studio, we see some of the body here, and then here we have this mirror that is showing us him, and we're not really sure where he is, right? Like, where is the body? Whose body is it? Is this a mirror? Is this a photographic print that is hanging there? Um, all of these things that destabilize our relationship to the image that make what the camera saw unclear, right? If we were there in the room when the picture was being taken, what exactly would we see? What does the space that the camera operates in look like? Um, and he and a couple of other photographers uh, that we'll see in the semester destabilize that in a way that I find really compelling and interesting. Um, again, right, so here we have sort of photographic prints that are taped up. There are sort of hands holding things, um, right? There is a chair back here that someone is sitting in. There is a hand here. There is sort of like, like trying to squeeze it smaller on the screen. That doesn't work. Um, you know, there are bodies in here, and we don't know whose is whose. Um, obviously, you know, there is a um, sort of homoerotic undertone in a lot of these, although there's not, you know, these are not pictures that are a bunch of like, you know, dudes fucking or whatever. Um, but there is certainly a homosociality, um, if not a homo <laughs> homoeroticism, homoeroticism um, in the pictures. I, I think they're incredible incredibly beautiful. Uh, if you think about his color palette, right, the like sort of the the softness of the tones, the grays, right, um, tone down there, um, the skin tone, the way that um, the body sort of abut one another, the sort of presence of the photographic studio, right, again making us aware of the making of the photograph. There are photographs which feel on one level very casual but are really carefully considered. I mean, I, he's an incredibly thoughtful, um, I mean, like I know, whatever, I've heard him speak, uh, incredibly thoughtful person um, who does an enormous amount of, um, you know, sort of like research and building source material and getting these other images and then bringing those images back in, right? Like, even just the, the process of making these big pictures you know, like you have to go print them out and then cut them up and figure out what the shape wants to be in, where it's going to go in the frame, right? Like this is not something which just happens all of a sudden. Um, or maybe it is, but I don't think so. Um, so they're formally beautiful without feeling stilted. Um, I think they're just absolutely incredible. Um, Right? Again, right? There is, if, uh, like, look, think about the bell pepper, right? Like, that Weston, right? That, I will bet you, I'm an adjunct, I'll bet you $5. That's all I got. Um, that he is thinking about Weston's bell pepper in making this photograph, right? It is too precisely similar for that 
to be coincidental, right? There's this pedestal, there's all these sort of like, you know, this, there we have the um, tripod over there um, for all of this to be an accident. Um, it is working, again, with the language of art history. Um, if you think about Nan Golden, right? She has images which have an, it's like an erotic energy, but that are very different. They're about there, you're in a party, like things are going on, like maybe somebody like, you know, gets crazy, does a bunch of drugs, um, you get like beaten up, right? Like all this stuff that happens, um, there is a smoothness to these images, a sort of the body held in position, a strength in them, um, an elegance, maybe that's the right word, um, that, I mean, I don't know, I think it's fucking incredible, um, right? And again, right, the fact that we are looking at the picture being taken, so this is a photograph into a mirror, um, and you can see sort of like some foreground elements down at the bottom in front of that mirror. Right, so that destabilization of where that plane of the photograph actually is, again, I mm, love it. Um, okay, so uh, those are a bunch of people working in self-portraiture. I think that that is more than enough um, for you to start thinking about what self-portraiture can be. Um, look at the assignment sheet, right? So the assignment sheet is going to tell you more about what you should actually be doing with your self-portrait. Um, there are rules, requirements of what you're doing. Um, think about how people are doing it. Think about the issues that can be brought up. Um, think about some of the pitfalls that people maybe have run into, um, what is appealing to you, what is unappealing to you. Um, and uh, yeah, get started on that stuff. Uh, you should be shooting images um, this week and you should have some stuff uh, already by next class. So, all right, enjoy. <laughs>